Chapter 18 The Return Journey When Bilbo came to himself, he was literally by himself. He was lying on the flat stones of Ravenhill, and no one was near. A cloudless day, but cold, was broad above him. He was shaking and as chilled as stone, but his head burned with fire. Now I wonder what has happened, he said to himself. At any rate, I have not yet one of the fallen heroes, but I suppose there's still enough time for that. He sat up painfully. Looking into the valley, he could see no living goblins. After a while, as his head cleared a bit, he thought he could see elves moving the rocks below. He rubbed his eyes. Surely there was a camp still in, pla in the plain some distance off, then there was a coming and going about the gate. Dwarves seemed to be busy removing the wall, but all was deadly still. There was no call nor an a no echo of song. Sorrow seemed to be in the air. V victory after all, I suppose, he said, feeling his aching head. Well, it seems a very gloomy business. Suddenly he was aware of a man climbing up and towards him. Hello there, he crawled out with a shaky voice. Hello there, what news? Uh, what, 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 sorry. Hello there, hello there, he's called with a shaky voice. Hello there, what news? What voice that speaks among the stones, said the man, halting and peering about him. Not far off where Bilbo sat. Then Bilbo remembered the ring. Well, I am blessed, said he. This invisibility has its drawbacks after all. Otherwise, I suppose I might have been in a warm and comfortable... I might have spent a warm and comfortable night in bed. It is me, Bilbo Baggins, companion of Thorin, he cried, and hurried off, take, he hurried, taking off his ring. It is well that I have found you, said the man, straining forward. You are needed, and we have looked for you long. You would have been numbered among the dead, if who were many, if Gandalf the wizard had not said your voice was last heard in this place. I have been sent here to look for the last time. Uh, uh, are you much hurt? A nasty knock on the head, I think, said Bilbo. But I have a helm and a hard skull. All the same, I feel sick, and my legs are like straws. I will carry you down to the camp in the valley, said the man, and picked him lightly up. The man was swift and sure-footed. It was not long before Bilbo was set upon the set down before a tent and dale, and there stood Gandalf, with an in his with his arm in a sling. Even the wizard had not escaped without a wound, and there were few unharmed in all the host. When Gandalf saw Bilbo, he was delighted. Baggins, he explained, well, I never. After life, after all, I am glad. I began to wonder if your luck would see you through. Terrible business, and it was nearly was disastrous. But other news can wait. Come, he said more gravely. You're called for. And leading the hobbit, he took him within the tent. Hail Thorin, he said, uh, said he as he entered. I have brought him. There indeed lay Thorin Oakenshield, wounded with many wounds, and his rent armor and notched axe were cast upon the floor. He looked up on as Bilbo came beside him. Farewell, good thief, he said. I now go to the halls of waiting to sit beside my fathers until the world is renewed. Since I now leave all gold and silver and go where it is of little worth, I wish to part in friendship from you, and I would take back my words and deed at the gate. Bilbo knelt on one knee filled of sorrow. Farewell, king under the mountain, he said. This is a bitter adventure, if it must end so, and not a mountain of gold can amend it. Yet I am glad to have shared in your perils. That has become been more than any Baggins deserves. No, said Thorin. There is more of you of good and good than you know, child of the kindly West. Some courage and some wisdom blended in measure. If more of us valued food and cheer and song above hoarded gold, it would be a merrier world. But sad or merry, I must leave it now. Farewell. Then Bilbo turned away, and he was went by himself and sat alone wrapped in a blanket, and whether he believed it or not, he wept until his eyes were red and his voice was hoarse. 
he was a kindly little soul. Indeed, it was long before he had the heart to make a, a joke again. Mercy it is, said he at last to himself, that I woke up when I did. I wish Thorn was living, but I am glad to have parted in kindness. You are a fool, Pilbo Baggins. You made a great mess of that business of the stone. There was a battle, in spite of all of your efforts to buy peace and quiet. But I suppose you can hardly be blamed for that. All that had happened after he was stunned, Bilbo learned later, but it gave him more sorrow than joy, and he was now weary of his adventure. He was aching in his bones for the homeward journey. That, however, was a little delayed, so in the meantime I'll tell you some of some of the uh, something of the events. The eagle had long had suspicions of the goblins mustering, from their watchfulness and the movements of the mountains could not all be together hid. So they had too had gathered in great numbers, under the great eagle of the misty mountains, and at length smiling battle from afar, they had come speeding down the gale in the nick of time. They, they, it was also who dislodged the goblins from the mountain slopes, casting them down over the precipices, or driving them down shrieking and bewildered among their foes. It was not long before they had freed the lonely mountain, and the elves and men on either side of the valley could come at last to the help of the battle below. But even with the eagles, they were still outnumbered. In that last hour, Bjorn himself had appeared. No one knew how or from where. He came alone, in a bear's shape, and he seemed to have grown almost to giant, -like, giant size in his wrath. The roar of his voice was like drums and guns. He tossed wolves and goblins from his path like straws and feathers. He fell upon their rear, broke like a clap of thunder through the ring. The dwarves were making a standstill in their lords upon a low, rounded hill. Then Bjorn stooped and lifted Thorin, who had fallen pierced by spears, and bore him out of the fray. Swiftly he returned, and his wrath was redoubled, so that nothing could withstand him, and no weapon seemed to bite upon him. He scattered the bodyguard and pulled down Bolg himself and crushed him. Then dismay fell on the goblins, and they fled in all directions. But weariness left their enemies with the coming of new hope, and they pursued them closely, prevented most of them from escaping where they could. They drove many of them into the running river. Such as they fled south or west, they hunted into the marshes above the forest river. And there the greater part of the flash fugitives perished, while those who came hot who came hard, hardly to the wood elves realm where they're slain or drawn in to die deep in the dark tr in the terrakless dark of the murkwood songs have been said that three parts of the goblin warrior three parts of the goblin warriors of the north perished that on that day and the mountains had ha the mountains had peace for many a year victory had been assured before the fall of night but the pursuit was still on foot when bilbo returned to the camp and not many were in the valley, save the more grievously wounded. Well, where are the eagles? said he asked Gandalf that evening, as he lay wrapped in warm blankets. Some are on the hunt, said the wizard, but most have gone back to the Eries. They would stay there, but they departed with the first light of morning. They would not stay here, and departed with the first light of morning. Dane has crowned their chief with gold, and swore friendship with them forever. I'm sorry, I mean, I would have, should have liked to see them again, said Bilbo sleepily. Perhaps I shall see them on the way home. I suppose I should be all going home soon. As soon as you'd like, said the wizard. Actually, it was some day before Bilbo was re really set out. They buried their thorn deep beneath the mountain, and Bard laid the ark and stone upon his breast. There let it lie until the mountain falls, he said. May it bring good fortune upon to all the fo his folk that dwell hereafter. Upon his tomb the elven king then laid Orcus, Orcrist, the elvish sword that had been taken from Thorin in captivity. It is said in the songs to, that it gleamed ever in the dark if foes approached, and the fortress of the dwarves could not be taken by surprise. There now Dane, son of Nain, took upon his took up his abode, and became king under the mountain. And in mid-time many other dwarves gathered to his throne in their ancient hills. Of the twelve companions of Thorin, ten remained. 
Feely and Keelian had fallen defending him with shield and body, for he was their mother's eldest brother. The others remained with Dane, for Dane dealt his treasure well. There was, of course, no longer any question of dividing the hoard in such shares as had been planned, to Balin and Dwalin, and Dory and Nori and Ori, and Owen and Glowen and Biffer and Bofer and Bombar, or to Bilbo. Yet a fourteenth share of it all, the silver and gold, wrought and unwrought, was given up to Bard, for Dane said, We will honour the agreement of our dead, and he now has the Arkenstone in his keeping. Even a fourteenth share was wealth exceedingly great, greater than m m m of that of many mortal kings. From the treasure, Bard sent many of the gold to the master of Lake Town, and he rewarded his followers and friends freely. To the elven king, he gave the emeralds of Kyrian, such jewels as he loved most, which Dane had restored to him. To Bilbo he said, The treasure is much as yours as it is mine, though old agreements cannot stand since so many have a claim in its winning and defense. Yet, even though you were willing to lay aside all your claim, I should wish that the words of Thorin, of which he repented, should not prove true, that we would have should give you little. I would reward you most, ri most richly of all. Ha, how kind of you, said Bilbo, but really, it, it is a relief to me. How on earth shall I have got all this treasure home without a war and murder along the way? I don't know. I don't think I, I know what I should have done with it when I got home. I'm sure it is much better in your hands. In the end, you would only take small, two small chests, one filled with silver, the other with gold, and such as strong as one pony could, strong pony can handle. That's, that will be quite as much as I can manage, said he. At last, the time came for him to say goodbye to his friends. Farewell, Balin, he said, and farewell, farewell, Dwalin, and farewell, Dory, Nori, Ori, Owen, Glowen, Biffer, Balfer, Bal and Bombar. May your beards never grow thin. And turning towards the mountain, he added, Farewell, Thorin, Oakenshield, and Feely and Keely. May your memory never fade. Then the dwarves bowed low before their gate, but words struck and stuck in their throats. Goodbye and good luck, wherever you fare, said Balin at last. If ever you visit us again, when our hall is made fair once more, then the feast shall indeed be splendid. If you were ever passing my bay, said Bilbo, don't wait to knock. Tea is at four, but if you're, uh, you, any of you are welcome at any time. Then he turned away. The elf host was on the march, and if it is sad, was sadly lessened, Yet many were glad, for now the northern world would be merrier for many a long day. The dragon was dead, the goblins overthrown, and their hearts looked forward after the winter to a spring of joy. Gandalf and Bilbo rode behind the elven king, and beside them strode Bjorn, once again in a man's shape, and he laughed and sang in a loud voice upon the road. So they went on till they drew near the borders of Mirkwood to the north of the place where the forest river ran out. Then they halted, for the wizard and Bilbo would not enter the wood, even though the king bade them stay a while in his halls. They intended to go around along the edge of the forest, round its northern end in the waste that lay between it and the beginning of the Grey Mountains. It was a long and cheerless road, but now that the goblins were crushed, it seemed safer to them than the dreadful pathways under the trees. Moreover, Bjorn was going that way, too. Farewell, O oh, Ilven King, said Gandalf. May the green wood, while the world is may while the world is yet young, and merry be your folk. Farewell, O oh, Gandalf, said the king. May your may you ever appear where you are most needed and least expected. The often uh, you appear in my halls, the better I shall I be pleased. I beg of you, said Bilbo, stammering and standing on one foot, to accept this gift, and he brought out a necklace of silver and pearls that Dane had given him at the parting. In what way have I earned such a gift, O oh hobbit? said the king. Well, I er, um, I thought, don't you know, said Bilbo, rather confused, that er, some little return shall be made for your, um, 
hospitality. I mean, even a burglar has his feelings. I may have drunk, and drunk much of your wine and eaten, eaten much of your bread. I will take, will take you a gift, O Bilbo the Magnificent, said the king gravely. And I now name you elf friend and blessed. May your shadow never grow less, or stealing would be too easy. Farewell. Then the elves turned towards the forest, and Bilbo started on his long road home. He had many hardships and adventures before he got back. The west, the wild, was still the wild, and there were many other things out there besides in that those days beside goblins. But he was well guided and well guarded. The wizard was with him, and Bjorn for much of the way, and he had never been in much danger again. Anyway, by midwinter, Gandalf and Bilbo had come all the way back, uh, along both, edg both edges of the forest to the dwarn of doors of Bjorn's house, and there for a while they both stayed. Yuletide was warm and merry there, and men came from far and wide to feast at Bjorn's bidding. The goblins of the misty mountains were now few and terrified, and hidden in the deepest holes they could find, and the wargs had vanished from the woods so that men could wind abroad without fear. Bjorn intended to become a, indeed, became a great chief afterwards in those regions, and ruled a wide land between the mountains and the wood, and it is said for that for many generations of men, the men of his line had the power of taking bare shape, and so for some were grim men and bad, but most were in heart like Bjorn, if in less size and strength. In their day, since the last goblins were hunted from the misty mountains, and a new pace came, peace came over the edges of the wild. It was spring, and a fair one with mild weathers, and a bright sun, before Bilbo and Gandalf had took their leave at last of Bjorn. And through, though he longed for home, Bilbo left with regret, for the flowers of the gardens of Bjorn were in springtime no less marvellous than in high summer. At last they came upon I'm up the long road, and reached the very pass where the goblins had captured them before. But they came to the high point in the moor at morning. Looking backwards, they saw a white sun shining out over the outstretched lands. There behind lay Mirkwood, blue in the distance, and darkly green at the nearer edge even in the spring. There far away was the lonely mountain on the edge of eyesight. On its highest peak, snow yet unmelted was a gleaming pale. So comes snow after fire, and even dragons have their ending, said Bilbo. And he turned his back on his adventure. The Tookish part of it was getting quite very tired, and the Baggins was, um, was, was daily getting stronger. I only wish now I was in my own armchair, he said. Chapter 19 The Last Stage It was on May the 1st that the two came back at last to the brink of the valley of Rivendell, where stood the last, or the first, homely house. Again, it was evening, and the po their ponies were tired, especially the one that carried the baggage, and they all felt a needed rest. As they rode down the steep path, Bilbo heard the elves still singing in the trees, as if they had not stopped since he left, and as soon as the riders came down to the lower glades of the wood, they burst into a song much like this as before. This is something like it. The dragon is withered, his bones now crumbled, his armor is shivered, his splendor is humble, splendor is humbled. Though sword shall re rusted, and throne and crown perish, with strength that man trusted, and wealth that they cherished. Here grass is still growing, and leaves are still swinging, with the white water flowing, and the elves are yet singing, Come, tra la 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 lay, come back to the valley. The stars are far brighter than gems without measure, the moon is far, far wider than silver and treasure. The fire is more shining on hearth in the gloom, gloaming than golds won by mining so why go a roaming oh tra la 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 lee come back to the valley oh where are you going so late in returning the river is flowing the stars are all burning 
oh whither is so laden so sad and so dreary here elf and elf maiden now come now welcome the wearily with tra la la lee come back to the valley tra la la lee fa la la lee fa la the elves of the, then the elves of the valley came out and greeted them and led them across the water to the house of elrond there was a warm welcome was there a warm welcome was made them and there were many eager ears and ev that evening to hear the tale of their adventures gandalf it was who spoke for bilbo had fallen quiet and drowsy much of the tale he knew but he for he had been in it and he had told himself much of it to the wizard on their homeward journey in the house of Bjorn, but every now and then he would open an eye and listen, when a part of the story which he did not know came in. It was this way that he learned where Gandalf had been to, for he overheard the words of the wizard to Elrond. It appeared that Elrond had been to a great council of the white wizards, masters of lore and good magic, and they had, had at last driven the necromancer from his dark hold south of Mirkwood. Oh, no, now, said Gandalf the forest will grow somewhat more wholesome the north will shall be freed from the horror from the north will be freed from their horde for many long years i hope yet i wish he were banished from the world it would be indeed so said elrond but i fear that he would not come about in this age of the world or for many after when the tale of the journeyings with journeyings were told there were other tales and yet more tales tales of long ago and tales of new things and tales of no time at all till bilbo's head fell forward on his chest and he snored comfortably in a corner he woke to find himself in a white bed and the moon shining through an open window below it many elves were singing loud and clear on the banks of the stream sing all ye joyful now sing all together the winds in the treetops and the winds in the heather the stars are on blossom and the moon is in flower and bright are the windows of the night in her tower dance all ye joyful now dance all together soft is the grass and let the foot be like feather the river is silver the shadows are fleeting merry is maytime and merry are meeting sing now we softly and dreams let us weave them wind him in slumber and there may let us leave him the wanderer sleepeth now soft be his pillow lullaby lullaby alder and willow sigh no more pine till the wind of the morn fall moon dark beyond the la be the land hush hush oak ar oak ash and thorn hushed be all water till dawn is at hand well merry people said bilbo looking out what time by the moon is this your lullaby would wake waken a drunken goblin yet i thank you and your and your snores would waken a stone dragon yet we thank you they asked out of laughter it is still only drawing towards dawn and you have slept now since night's beginning to-morrow perhaps you will be cured of your weariness a little sleep does great cure in the house of elrond said he i will take all the cure i can get a second good night fair friends and with that he went back to his bed and slept till late morning weariness fell from him some soon in the house and he had many a merry and j merry jest and dance early and late with the elves of the valley yet even in that place he could not delay him now and he th always thought of his own home after a week, therefore, he said farewell to Elrond, and giving him such small gifts as he would accept, he rode away with Gandalf. Even as they left the valley, the sky darkened in the west before them, and the wind and rain came up to met meet them. Merry is Maytime, said Bilbo, as the rain beat into his face. Ah, but our back is to legends, and we are coming home. I suppose this is the first taste of it. There is yet yeah, there is a long road yet, yeah, said Gandalf. But it is the last road, said Bilbo. They came to the river and that marked the very edge of the borderland for the west, and to the ford beneath the steep bank, which you remember. The water was swollen both with the melting of snows the approaching of summer, and with the day long rain they crossed with some difficulty, and pressed forward as evening fell, on the last stage of their journey this was much as it had been before 
except the company was smaller and more silent. Also, this time, there was no trolls. And at each point on the road, Bilbo recalled the happenings that, of course, he quickly noted the place that his first pony had fallen to the river, where they'd turn aside for their nasty adventures with Tom, Bert, and Bill. Not far from the road, they found the gold of the trolls, which they had buried, still hidden and untouched. Oh, I have enough to last me my time, said Bilbo, when they had dug it up. You had better take this gand off. I dare say you can find a use for it. Indeed I can, said the wizard. But share and share alike. You may find you have more needs than you expect. So they put the, gold, the golden bags and slung it on the ponies, who were not at all pleased about it. After that, their going was slower, for most of the time they walked. But the land was green, and there was much grass, though, though which the hobbit strolled along contentedly. He mopped his face with the red silk handkerchief. No, not a single one from his own that survived. He borrowed this one from Elrond, for now June had brought summer, and the weather was bright and hot again. As all things come to an end, even this story, a day came at last when they were in sight of the country where Bilbo had been born and bred, where the shapes of the land and of all the trees were well as well known to him as his hands and toes. Coming to a rise, he could see his own hill in the distance, and he stopped suddenly and said, Roads go ever on and on, over rock and under tree, by caves where sun has never shone, by streams that never found the sea, over snow by winter sown, and through many the merry month flowers of June, over grass and over stone, and under mountains in the moon. Roads go ever on and on, under cloud and under star, yet the feet that wandering have gone turn at last to home afar. Eyes that fire and sword have seen, and horror in the halls of stone, look at last upon meadows green, and trees and hills that they long have known. Gandalf looked at him. My dear Bilbo, he said, something is the matter with you. You are not the hobbit that you were and they crossed the bridge and passed the mill by the river, and came right back to Bilbo's own door. Bless me, what is going on? he cried. There was a great commotion, and people of all sorts, respectable and unrespectable, were round or thick round the door, and many were going in and out, not even wiping their feet on the mat, as Bilbo noticed with annoyance. If he was surprised, they were more surprised still. He had arrived back in the middle of an auction. There was a large notice in black and red hanging on the gate, stating that on June twenty second, Mrs. Grubb, Grubb and Burrows would sell by auction the effects of the late Bilbo Baggins, Esquire of Bag End, Underhill, Hobbiton. Sale to commence at ten o'clock sharp. It was now nearly lunch time, and most of things had already been sold for various prices from the next, next from next to nothing to old songs, as is not unusual at auctions. Bilbo's cousins, the Sackville Bagginses, were, in fact, busy measuring his rooms to see if their own furniture would fit. In short, Bilbo was presumed dead, and not everybody that said so was sorry to find the presumption wrong. The return of Mr. Bilbo Baggins created quite a disturbance, both under the hill and over the hill, and across the water. It was a great deal more than nine days' wonder. The legal bother, indeed, lasted for years. It had been quite a long time before Mr. Baggins was, in fact, admitted to be alive again. The people who had got him sp had gotten specifically good bargains at the sale took a deal of convincing, and in the end, to save time, Bilbo had to buy back quite a lot of his own furniture. Many of his silver spoons uh, mysteriously disappeared and were never accounted for. Personally, he suspected the Saxville Bagginses. On their side, they never admitted that admitted that the returned Baggins was genuine, and they were not on friendly terms with Bilbo ever after. They really wanted him to live in his nice hobbit. They really had wanted to live in his nice hobbit hole so very much. Indeed, Bilbo had found he had lost more than spoons. He had lost his reputation. It is true that forever after he remained an elf friend, and that the honor of dwarves and wizards and all sorts of folk that he passed along his way, but he was never quite respectable. He was, in fact, held by, by all hobbits of his neighborhood to be queer 
except by his nephews and nieces on the Took side, but even then they were not encouraged in their friendship by, the, by their elders. I am sorry to say that he did not mind. He was quite content, and the sound of the kettle on his hearth was, as, was ever after more musical than it had been in the quiet days before the unexpected party. His sword he hung over the mantelpiece. His coat of mail was arranged to stand in the hill, until he lent it to a museum. His gold and silver was largely spent in presents, both useful and extravagant, which to a certain extent accounts for his affection from his nephews and nieces. Uh, his magic ring he kept a great secret, for he chiefly used it when unpleasant callers came. He took to writing poetry and visiting the elves, and though many shook their heads and touched their foreheads, said, Poor old Baggins, and though few believed any of his tales, he remained very happy to the end of his days, and those were extraordinarily long. One autumn evening, some years after Bilbo, years afterwards, Bilbo was sitting in a study writing his memoir. He thought of calling them There and Back Again. A hobbit's holiday. And there was a ring at the door. It was Gandalf, and a dwarf, and the dwarf was actually Balin. Come in, come in, said Bilbo, and soon they were settled in chairs by the fire. If Bilbo had noticed that Mr. Baggins's waistcoat was more extensive, and had real gold buttons, Bilbo also noticed that Balin's beard was several inches longer, and his jeweled belt was of great magnificence. They fell to talking of their times together, of course, and Bilbo asked of things that were going on in the lands of the mountains. It had seemed they were going very well. Bard had rebuilt the town of Dale, and men had gathered to him uh, from the lake in the south and the west, and all the valley had become tilled again and rich, and the desolation was now filled with birds and blossoms in spring, and fruit and feasting in autumn and lake town was refounded and it was more prosperous than ever and much wealth went up than down the running river and it was friendship in those parts between elves and dwarves and men the old master had come to a bad end bard had given him much gold for the help of the lake people but being of the kind that easily catches such disease he fell under, under the dragon sickness and took much of the gold and fell fled with it and died of starvation in the waste deserted by his companions the new master is of a wiser kind said balin and very popular for of course he gets most of the credit for the present prosperity they are making songs that say that in that day the rivers flown with gold and the prophecies of the old songs have turned out to be true after a fashion said bilbo of course said gandalf why should you not prove to be true surely you don't disbelieve the prophecies because you had a hand in bringing them about yourself you don't really suppose do you that after all your adventures and escapes were managed by mere luck just for your sole benefit you are a very fine person, Mr. Baggins, and I am very fond of you. But you are only quite a little fellow in the wide world, after all. <laughs> Thank goodness, said Bilbo, laughing, and handed him the tobacco jar. And that has been The Hobbit, or There and Back Again. And their story, Smile Upon You.